Uh, I'm Jack Wright. I'm a philosopher of economics at the University of Cambridge and one of the organizers of this series. And um, today we're delighted to be joined by Will Davis to explore the models of rationality, rulemaking and control that maybe part explain some of the government's responses to the pandemic. Will can tell me if that's correct or not. <coughs> Will is a professor of political economy at Goldsmiths University and is a prolific writer who's produced work on a wide range of topics, most of them related to our project's themes. So including neoliberalism and the history of the behavioral sciences. Um, his work in general focuses on the exact same mix of questions that our project um, discusses with an interest in how economic ideas relate to politics and our understanding of politics. And he's previously contributed to our seminar series when we used to collect live and in flesh. Uh, and we're delighted to be able to welcome him back, um, albeit in digital form. Um, and in today, he's going to be joined by one of our very own organizers, uh, Alice Pearson, um, who's an anthropologist from the University of Cambridge also, and one of the co-organizers of the project. <clears throat> the session is going to start um, in a second. I'll give Alice and Will to chat about the topic first. I'm going to start with about 30 to 35 minutes of them chatting um, in conversation with one another. Um, and then it's going to be followed by questions from the rest of you that I'll read out from the chat box. So if you want to ask questions, just write them into the chat box and I'll collect them and try and ask them in the general order that they come in. <clears throat> you feel free to ask questions from now <laughs> or from whenever, um, uh, and I'll collect them and try and ask. Uh, ask them in order. Um, if you're watching on YouTube stream, um, you can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag PollEconCOVID19. Um, and we're going to aim to end uh, on, uh, around on the hour, but if there's many questions, we might run over by a few minutes, but obviously feel free to leave um, on the hour if needs be. Okay, um, before I hand over to Will and Alice, we have a quick poll um, which should be popping up on your screen for you guys to fill in now. Just to give us a vague idea of our audience. So we want to know where you're listening from, so which continent, um, which gender you most identify with, um, and uh, kind of wildcard question, have you stayed alert? Um, so I'll give you quickly 20, uh, 15 more seconds to fill that in um, before handing over to Will and Alice. I'm still not sure what having stayed alert means. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm obviously in the what does it mean camp. I think seemingly I can see the poll the results as they come in. That seems to be the winning uh, answer so far. All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds uh, and end the poll. Uh, I'm going to share the results so you should all see them on your screen now <laughs> if you want. Um, and I'll leave them up there for a couple of minutes um, before handing over to Alice to take it away. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Will, and thanks uh, everyone for joining us. Uh, it's really exciting to have Will here with us. Um, Will, I just wanted to start by kind of asking about the kind of conception of morality at play here and how that relates to our conception of society compared to the last crisis. So during 2008 financial crisis, um, moral hazard as a category did a lot of conceptual work, mm -hmm. uh, in both explaining why it happened, uh, how the response to it should be organized and then the aftermath of austerity, both in policy and in the media, um, it was deployed a lot. Uh, and moral hazard is quite a, a strange category. It's laden with certain Victorian morality and ethics of work most of the time, but it, economists would usually claim that it's just a kind of rational response to individual incentives. Mm. And it feels like we're doing something really different here at the moment. Uh, in a 2012 article, you talked about a shift from neoliberalism to neo-communitarianism, mm. which feels very prescient at this moment. And you've also written in your LRB article about whether we're kind of Dirk Hymians or uh, Tardians, which I don't think is a word and, and probably shouldn't be a word either. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what kind of, what do you think is our category of the moral at the moment and how does that relate to our conception of society and whether we're Durkheimians, Tardians, neo-communitarians or, or something else? Sure. Well, um, thank, and thanks very much to Jack and Alice for inviting me along uh, to do this. Um, it's a real pleasure to join your project uh, again to talk about these very interesting questions. Um, and I suppose to start with, with what you're, you asked me about, Alice, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, I wrote this, this paper in 2012, which was published in um, uh, Political Quarterly called The Emerging Neo-Communitarianism, which um, I hadn't actually looked at it for quite a while until um, before this session today. But when the current crisis broke back in, I suppose, March, um, I was reminded of many things that I'd written in that piece. 
um, which was an attempt to try and understand a new policy paradigm, which for, if you cast your mind back now nearly a decade, uh, in the years immediately following the financial crisis at the time when the coalition government had come in, there was a sort of strange sense that the kind of governing ideas of economics and of economic policymaking didn't seem to have changed substantially. And there were all of these kind of things like rethinking economics and uh, various complaints made from the left and from heterodox economists that the fundamental concepts of economics hadn't changed and that the fundamental notions about how regulation should happen shouldn't, shouldn't, hadn't changed. Um, and of course, also the austerity measures that were introduced um, under George Osborne from 2010 onwards um, did seem to obey this logic that you're referring to, Alice, of uh, a concept of moral hazard, partly that um, somehow that if the government was to engage in forms of Keynesian uh, demand stimulus, that that would somehow crowd out entrepreneurial investment and that you know cuts to benefits would actually lead people to become more job sort of seeking and more employable in some uh, magical fashion. But one of the things that interested me at the time was that there was also a, a set of discourses that in some sense were quite cosmetic, but, but in other senses weren't, which um, challenged the emphasis on individualistic rational choice um, as seen in the tradition of neoclassical economics and as in some ways is, is hegemonic within policymaking within, within Whitehall. Um, and on the one hand that had the kind of more, I suppose, more kind of um, sort of window dressing aspect of kind of red Toryism and, and blue labor and the sort of big society stuff that people like David Cameron were talking about of sort of, you know, how can we have a kind of, you know, uh, a sort of revitalization of civic, civic society. And of course that's, that's a sort of longstanding theme of, 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 of conservatism of, of various stripes. But then there was also, this was also the time when there was the kind of flowering of, um, behavioral economics within um, the policy making establishment. There was the creation of the what is now called the behavioral insights team, um, which otherwise known as the nudge unit. Um, and this seemed to rest on a different idea of how policy should proceed, which was built around a different idea of individual decision making and individual subjectivity. Um, and I developed this, this concept of what I call neo-communitarianism because my central argument in the piece is that the, 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 the individual as imagined by behavioral economists was to the image of neoclassical economics as communitarianism in political philosophy of people like Michael Sandel, Charles Taylor, Alistair McIntyre, as that was to the liberalism of John Rawls and the, uh, the, the Kantian tradition that they were rebelling against. And what I mean by that is that the, the individual as imagined by behavioral economics is one that is um, uh, cultured in certain respects. It has certain traditions, although it wouldn't be conceived of as traditions, they'd be conceived more as habits or heuristics or uh, sort of neural patterns perhaps of behavior that were not uh, rational in a kind of utility maximizing fashion as, as, as understood in neoclassical economics back to uh, the 1860s, 1870s, um, but that individuals get stuck in certain patterns of behavior that can be altered through changes to their uh, immediate social environment. And that's what the idea of a nudge is, that if you change the way choices are presented to people, you can also change the way in which um, they will behave and push them towards a path of, of greater rationality. I mean, one of the simplest ways of understanding the, the distinction between neoclassical economics and behavioral economics is that behavioral economics takes what is a method in neoclassical economics, i.e. a sort of vision of, of rational choice making and turns it into a norm, i.e. people have to be somehow sort of educated or, or cultivated or steered towards a path of, of, of rational decision making. But the other thing which I think is kind of communitarian about it is that what the nudgers understand is that, which most social scientists would see as not an especially remarkable insight, is that the greatest influence over how we behave is not kind of what the government tells us to do or um, what uh, market prices incentivize us to do, but what those around us are doing. So that if you want someone to, you know, if you want people to stop smoking, if you can kind of make it more normal not to smoke, or if you can encourage people to make promises to their family members or to their friends that they're not going to smoke, that this might actually be a better way of stopping them smoking and therefore have a lower net cost to the NHS than to raise the cost of cigarettes or to make it illegal to smoke. Although of course making it illegal to smoke indoors was one of the kind of <laughs> sort of path breaking ways in, in, in this particular nudge. But so there's a kind of social um, influenceable individual, which I think then came very much to the fore in March of this year. And of course the nudge unit and the presence of behaviorists on um, SAGE has been a kind of constant theme over the course of this crisis. Um, 
it is in some ways a behavior change crisis or a behavior change policy agenda scaled up uh, to, to tens of millions of people. So in that respect, that kind of to rather kind of marginal um, uh, set of policy innovations that developed, of course, behavioral economics dates back to the 1970s and, and in some ways longer, but as a policy agenda, it, it was kind of born at a time when David Cameron was looking for a way of somehow defining himself as, as not a simple neoliberal, I suppose, or not a simple kind of free marketeer. And, and now um, that policy infrastructure has, has become something that I think the, um, the, the government has, has lent on quite heavily, as far as I can tell. Mm, and it feels like, I mean, I don't know whether you think this was true or whether it's something you feel like you're saying, that, that the position of the kind of policymaker economist within that is quite similar to something that you wrote about in Nervous States, where the particular, and maybe the parallel here is the stay alert category as well, that basically the individual subject as this kind of post-dualist mm. person that's in a constant state of simultaneously witnessing and anticipating the world and themselves, but also producing it through those acts. Sure. Um, well, yeah, sorry, go on. No, go, no, go for it. I mean, well, do you I, think the, 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 I mean, this is the other interesting thing about this, this notion of subjectivity, because you could say that the neoclassical subject, um, which is in some ways, and this I wrote about in, in, in the happiness industry, my, my uh, the previous book, um, which is a, there's a kind of genealogy of a neoclassical subject that comes kind of by Bentham um, and within the, the English tradition, obviously it's very different in, a, in the Austrian tradition, but within the, the, within the tradition of, uh, of Anglo-American neoclassical economics, it's, it's a largely a disembodied um, uh, subject. Um, I think you could say that, that Hayek's um, in, the, in the Austrian tradition is, 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 is actually um, much closer to a, a, a sort of post-dualist or, or embodied notion of subjectivity. But certainly within the tradition of welfare economics, which is really the kind of governing paradigm of, of, of the treasury, if you read the, the treasury green book of, of policy evaluation, it's, it's, it's Arthur Pigou kind of turned into, into policy instructions. Um, and um, uh, but so you have a kind of in some ways what happens with the with the turn towards behavioral economics is also a, a turn towards an embodiment of a of a of, a, of the neoclassical self such that people um, start to concepts of the emotional brain which had been a very influential in uh, market research from the from the 1990s onward but the idea of there was this extraordinary paper you might remember that the that the nudge unit co co-authored with uh, the Institute for Government around about 2012 called um, Mind Space. I don't know if anyone, if you, if, you, if you saw this, but it was a sort of effectively a kind of manual on what to know about, about sort of brains and behavior for all policymakers so that they could, whenever you were sort of designing a, a policy, you could sort of sort of audit it, sort of check it, whether it was kind of brain compatible in, in, in certain respects. Um, but the, the turn towards the behavioral uh, and the psychological self is also a, a, a turn towards embodiment in certain respects. Um, and of course there is, and this comes back to Hayek, I suppose, in some ways, there is a, a, a parallel history of, of, of um, I suppose not really neoclassical economics, but a free market Austrian economics, um, which is in touch with cybernetics. And that is the, the tradition of, of Hayek. It is, uh, effectively assumes that the, the, I imagine most of the, um, I don't know if it's very difficult to know exactly who, who we're joined with by, by right now, but I mean, you know, it's so difficult to know kind of exactly, you know, how much how familiar, how much familiarity there is with, with Hayek's thought. But for Hayek, the advantage of, of the market was that it was a space of, uh, in which stimulus and response could be in a constant state of interactivity, that prices send out information to people, which they respond to either in the form of uh, consumer decisions or investment decisions or, or new kind of entrepreneurial strategies, but that um, human beings become locked into this kind of telecom network, uh, which is the, the price system. Um, and that they don't really need to think too hard about what the entire thing is doing. They certainly don't need to have a picture of the entire economy, but that what they need to do is to trust their instincts, trust their eyes, constantly interact with various kind of, you know, flashing sort of numbers that are rising and falling, rather like how you imagine the kind of Bloomberg terminals of, of, of Wall Street, where people are sort of, you know, the way in which the market is actually sort of visualized to people, the way it presents itself to people, the, the extent to which it is kind of visible on a single uh, control panel, it's absolutely crucial to someone's ability to actually play the market effectively. Um, now, this is something which really is 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 a, is a is a vision of the of the subject or of the self, because it's not really a subject in a, in a liberal tradition, which is associated with um, uh, the tradition of cybernetics, uh, which has 
uh, a vision of uh, human agency that is, uh, or post-human agency to be more literal about it, which is to think of human beings uh, as uh, black boxes which respond to stimuluses uh, in uh, particular ways that can be uh, uh, potentially predicted and controlled uh, depending on um, uh, uh, how much data can be captured about um, the, the various patterns that they're forming, uh, whether it be in a market or whether it be in any other kind of situation. And so this is a tradition of economics, which is certainly there in Hayek, and it certainly is there in a particular Austrian tradition of, of, of neoliberal thought, but was, I think, in some ways, uh, separate from the uh, Anglo-American tradition of, of welfare economics, and then what sort of flowed into the Chicago School of, of Neoliberalism via um, uh, the likes of, 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 of Ronald Coase and, and George Stigler and, and others. But what I think you see now with this idea of stay alert is certainly a, a vision of a, of a, of a cybernetic uh, agent uh, and a vision of agency that is also there in, in behavioral economics, but which is a, a vision of a, of, a, of, a, of a agent or human, human being who is um, constantly responsive and constantly adaptable to their environment and will alter their behavior depending on what types of cues are coming in from one moment to the next. So, um, of course, you have these kind of traffic light systems and uh, some of this has turned out to be kind of Boris Johnson's propaganda, but nevertheless, at least the kind of ideological vision that is being presented is of a society in which the rules of everyday conduct are going to be constantly tweaked in response to different types of data, different um, uh, things that are appearing on the control panels of the Joint Biosecurity Center, uh, and this, this will change things like, you know, maybe not literally how many meters you can stand next to someone in a pub or whatever, but it depends on an idea of, uh, of human agency that is really quite different from that of the conventional neoclassical consumer and is closer to something which I think is there in Hayek, but is certainly also there in behavioral economics of, uh, of a type of agent who uh, is uh, embodied and whose consciousness is heavily associated with the eyes. I mean, if you think of the, the meaning of stay alert is, or the, ter the, the, the term alert, its etymology comes from, I'm gonna pronounce this badly, the Italian, but it's uh, alerta, which means to the watchtower. So it is a, a visual uh, idea of agency, um, heavily oriented towards presenting people with different kinds of symbols and visuals and prompts, which are expected to change their behavior from one moment to the next. Um, and it also assumes a, an idea of norms, um, which can be introduced, removed, tweaked, changed uh, the entire time, which I think is extremely, um, it's extremely questionable the extent to which for, from a richer sociological, from a richer sociological perspective, the extent to which this idea of human beings from within this sort of behaviorist uh, cybernetic um, uh, ideal, to what extent that is something that from a more um, sort of substantive sociological perspective is actually something that can be uh, delivered upon. Yeah, I mean, you're really reminding me of kind of two quite disparate uh, things there, but that I think, that I guess I quite intimately uh, associate with each other in a slightly un perhaps unlikely way. Um, so thinking about, say, your book, Happiness Economics, something like uh, mindfulness, you know, which you were writing about the kind of shift to at the time, which, you know, on the, on the one hand is kind of casual colonialism or contemplative awareness therapeutic practices with a certain medicalized Buddhist imaginary. But on the other hand, there are, there are two quite distinct techniques that often get deployed there that, that exist in different ways throughout all Buddhist traditions. And one is one of this kind of uh, hyper attenuated, detached witness self, uh, kind of observing everything. And the other is this non-dualist collapse and this kind of weird oscillation that every strand of, you know, every kind of lineage in, in religion and, and school of psychology deals with, with this kind of oscillation differently, but it seems really attenuated like that this, and this subject object is simultaneously hyper witnessing and also collapse. That seems to me to kind of parallel something that's going on in. And I guess I, I think I'm starting, and maybe it's just where I'm at uh, in, in finishing my PhD at the moment, but, but I'm thinking about this kind of other trajectory and in behavioral that, that comes not so much through shifting notions of rationality, although it's intimately linked, but shifting notions of information, right? So you get these, critiques of perfect information in economics that, that give a weird arc from Hayek to 
you know, through asymmetric information, people like Stiglitz and Akalov, who would consider themselves ideologically quite opposed to Hayek in many ways, that then in the kind of Akalov-Schiller turn, you come to a kind of, you know, behavioral animal spirits, economists as lion tamers, but in this quite similar way to, I think, what you've just described that, and what's going on in that other kind of the individual shift is this hyper witnessing, but also simultaneously constantly producing. What I'm quite interested in there is like the notion of information in economics, like what you've described of the notion of the subject in Hayek is, is basically like quite black boxed, you know, it's, it's empty in some ways, it's quite vague. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if, if any of that would resonate or, or if you feel Yeah, like I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. I mean, there's, a, you know, you, you, you raise a lot of issues there. And I mean, information, I know there's a whole kind of history of, of, of information um, tied up with the, the history of cybernetics and of, and of the, um, obviously within the socialist calculation debate as well, of, which has been so important to the formation of neoliberalism as any reader of Philip Morawski um, is, is familiar with, with all of that. Um, I'm, I'm not someone, uh, someone when, I, when, when I delve into some of Morawski's stuff on, on, the, on the kind of more arcane aspects of information theory, I have to sort of, you know, <laughs> pretend that I still understand all of it and, and, and sort of uh, flick through a little bit. But uh, um, so I, 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 don't, I, I can't pretend to be a, a great expert on, on, on the, the status of information in, in all of this, uh, because some of it gets so mathematical and, 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 and difficult. Um, I think that there's an interesting, there's certainly interesting on, on your issue about the sort of dualist, non-dualist. Um, I mean, it's certainly something which, in my work on happiness, economics, and positive psychology, I mean, this 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 comes up a lot. Uh, it's also something actually, which, since I mentioned Murawski, I mean, it's interesting. Murawski has this notion of the double truth of economics, which is related to this as well. Uh, what Murawski means by the double truth of economics is that. Um, how neoliberals who, as, as those of you are familiar with Murawski's work, you know, Murawski sees neoliberal thought collectors are very much a, a clearly defined set of intellectuals and think tanks and, and, and economists and, and, and philosophers and so on. But, but for Murawski, um, uh, the, the neoliberals want ordinary people to see the market in a different way from how they see the market, in the sense that what they want, they want just ordinary people to see the market as a, as a purely kind of natural phenomenon that has no one actually governing it and has no type of political intervention or construct whatsoever. Meanwhile, the way the neoliberals in their think tanks and their um, uh, smoke filled rooms and their, their, their university seminar rooms and that sort of thing see the market is as something that needs to be um, uh, artificially designed and enforced and regulated and, and backed up with, with police power fundamentally. Um, and that this is why the, you know, there is this kind of Schmittian strand to neoliberalism. So there's always this kind of like sense of, you know, what, what the ordinary people are expected to do and what the, what the elites how the elites are expected to see the world diverge. When it comes to something like economic psychology and, and happiness economics, I think this is often quite present just in some of the basic discourses of, of positive psychology. I and mean, you started off by talking about mindfulness, which is to say, you know, science tells you that, that, that you have to kind of meditate and sort of somehow kind of, you know, just watch your, you know, the, 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 there's a sort of, there's a kind of flipping that goes on between a kind of positivist posit uh, vision of psychology um, and a kind of pragmatist, um, uh, almost, you know, Heideggerian or, or sort of, a sort of, you know, just, you have to sort of dwell in it within your particular uh, time and space and not attempt some kind of objective uh, vision of it. I think that, the way this would play out, this same sort of double truth, the way I suppose it plays out in something like the current pandemic is that, um, and which really became very clear, I have this article, um, for, for Alice has already seen this actually, but I have an article coming out in tomorrow's New Statesman about the sort of crisis of, of rules in all of this, which of course became extremely um, uh, sort of visible around the coming scandal of, of, of the end of May. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to tell people because it was all you could read about for about a week was the you know, Cummings trip to Durham and, and, and to, to, to Barnard Castle and this sort of thing. Um, but the, effectively, I think that the sort of the, the, the cybernetic behaviorist um, project is one in which the vast majority of people uh, are acting 
in response to various cues, so they get presented with various stimuluses and uh, and information, which uh, hopefully if it, if, it, if it goes through and, and, and they respond and the, the, the message is carried through, which is the kind of central challenge of information, um, that they respond in a certain way and uh, that response is hopefully captured in some way. Of course, the government at the moment doesn't have any of the, the wherewithal to really deliver on that, that capture of data. Um, but that those who are on the other side of the, the control room, whether that be, you know, um, you know, someone who's controlling some kind of tech platform um, or whatever it might be, um, are not bound by the same rules of, of, of society um, as those who, for whom these, these, these norms are basically rolled out as forms, as, as, as nudges, as, as ways of changing behavior. So effectively, what this, this nudge project um, does is to turn norms into instruments for the alteration of somebody else's behavior. Now, that's a very different idea of what a norm is from many other traditions of, of social science and, and, and moral philosophy and so on. Um, in fact, it's a rather sort of um, unrecognizable vision of a norm uh, or, or a rule to, to many working within a, within a say, a Durkheimian tradition or a, a tradition of, 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 of pragmatist uh, social science. Um, and yet, I think when you think about kind of what is it that you know, without wanting to do getting to sort of Cummingsology, you know, what, what is it that sort of, you know, someone like Cummings thinks he might be doing and why do, do rules not apply to him is that in a sense, and I think this is why there was such an outcry, is that the rules of the lockdown were presented as being those which were something like a social contract, as if in a, in a kind of tradition of, of liberal political theory, as something which we're all going to buy into this thing. Um, and that we're making, we're all making a shared sacrifice for some common good. It's a very much a kind of contractualist idea of, of, of what that sort of distress and, and, and um, uh, various forms of loss, how it was legitimated. The discovery that actually the norms were uh, nudges, which um, if some reports are to be believed from people like Neil Ferguson, actually they were quite surprised by how often, how, how, to the extent to which people actually did obey those rules. The discovery that actually these rules were sort of not really rules at all, but were simply sort of pieces of sort of environmental conditioning or information, which aimed to try and sort of tweak behavior, which of course they always were gonna be something like that because the challenge was behavioral, not civic or, or judicial um, but I think that was a that was a huge moment in the rupture and the and a huge loss of legitimacy actually around about over the course of of, of, of May and June for this government. Trust in the government plummeted over that, that time. But I think that in some ways that that was at the core of that particular crisis and I don't quite know how that gets repaired again. Mm, yeah naive about the, the possibilities for the, of the liberal state to, to sort of win consent in a universal way, but it kind of did win consent in a, in a, in a remarkable and I think quite unpredicted fashion um, from, from late March onwards. Yeah, and I think that raises a lot of really interesting questions. I mean, not just for sociologists, but also just beyond that within these kind of dynamics and policy making of what does it mean when kind of sociologists supposedly quite often critical categories of norms and performativity then get deployed performativity performatively, uh, you know, by economists and slightly all policymakers in a slightly kind of calculative way. Um, and, I, you know, I'm wondering, kind of maybe orientating this towards, I should also just say before that this, you know, the stay alert thing, I think I kind of didn't conclude that with the, you know, it's just the sheer fact that you can't see a COVID, this invisibility of the constant visibility is perhaps like why this hyper attenuation and disintegration of visibilities. But, but coming back to, to that thing about um, performativity and moving forwards, I mean, this might be a good time, Jack, if you kind of um, want to come in here as well. But uh, yeah, I'm wondering how you see this, where you see this moving and resolving. I mean, we've obviously had this quite, we've had this enormous shift in our understanding of the social contract mm -hmm. um, with a lot of economic sacrifices for a lot of people. Um, and this might, you know, I'm wondering where you see this, how you see the aftermath. I mean, I think that the, I think that there's a, um, I mean, I, I, without wanting to get into a sort of whole discussion of, you know, the government's policy handling of, of the crisis, which I mean, there's been, you know, there's so much to say about, it, and I'm certainly not an expert on it. But um, I mean, I think that it seems that the sort of desired um, path that the government is is taking, it seems to me anyway, is a, a sort of um, based in a in a cybernetic vision 
that if the data um, infrastructure can be developed in a sophisticated enough fashion, which is ironically what they seem to be particularly bad at at the moment, uh, particularly funny given Matt Hancock comes from the kind of tech sector and it sort of has been waiting for a, a problem that he can solve using an app seemingly all his career and, 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 has, and, has, and has failed to rise to the, to the challenge that it's sort of in some ways is sort of um, the one he was, he was born to. Um, uh, but if, if the data could be, could be collected in a way that he's, up to up to uh, is 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 synchronic enough, or if that's not a um, sort of misnomer, but you know is, is is real time enough in some sense, and is also localized enough. Which of course they also haven't yet been able to do, which is the was the problem in Leicester, which they didn't have the, the local data didn't seem to to to, to be there or to be good enough. Uh, that it would be possible to run um, a policy that was sort of being tweaked um, over time and over space in a way that was sort of doing the other bit of the of the slogan of course is control the virus you know that you would control the virus you wouldn't try and uh, banish the virus um, you um, of course hopefully wait for a, a vaccine for the virus but in the meantime uh, you do this kind of control the virus you have a you know whack-a-mole I think is how Boris Johnson described it um, now um, so but I think this offers huge this is the, the, what this means for political authority. I think is extremely um, uh, sort of complicated and 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 problematic. I mean, already, of course, we've seen people have talked about the you know the breaking up of the, the United Kingdom as a result, specifically of this crisis, probably more than a, a Brexit, um, because of the the, the 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 importance of devolution and all of this. But um, you know, the other interesting thing about um, the, the cybernetic self and the kind of Hayekian aspect of this is that one, I suppose, one of the kind of distinguishing features of, of cybernetics is that communication is, 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 is a two-way street. It's not like kind of, you know, B.F. Skinner and his rats sort of trying to kind of get them to do different things by kind of moving different objects around and, and, and tweaking them and incentivizing them in a, in, a, in a sort of purely paternalistic way. But this idea of, 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 a, of, a, of a self that is alert, which is I think quite similar to the kind of Hayekian self who is a, a sort of entrepreneur or investor in a market, is that they actually have quite a lot of responsibility in all of this, that there is a, that there is a lot of decentralization of authority going on, um, although not in a way that actually is compatible with the way in which our politics, our parliament and our public sphere works, which is to constantly turn back towards the prime minister in Whitehall and say, what the hell are you doing? And yet what they probably seem to think they're doing and might like to be doing is to build some sort of system, some kind of data infrastructure, which can't be the market, although it does seem to me that maybe the market might be playing a certain role. I saw that various pubs have already had to close down over the last couple of days because of outbreaks of COVID within these pubs. Now, of course, in that sense, the market plays its role as an alert system all over again, just as, you know, Hayek hoped is to say, oh, well, you know, we now know that there's some COVID in this particular area because it's turned up in these pubs and they had to close. I mean, this, this all functions as a kind of a, a, a Hayekian telecom network. Um, but this does mean that the, the, the what government um, can promise to do or what it claims to be doing is really very unclear. Um, it also means that as the capacity of government to actually deliver on this vision of a real-time localized um, whack-a-mole type government, as the capacity of um, the Department of Health and um, the, the, the government, the rest of the government to actually deliver on this vision, deteriorates and as it visibly as people grow visibly uh, impatient and, and and distressed with its inability to deliver the the, the case for i don't know palantir or, or whichever um data analytics company is is already um you know whichever donors to to, to cooperate with vote leave or you know i don't want to start sounding like a sort of <laughs> remain conspiracy theorist but you know it, it is clear that there have been various um uh, data analytics companies that have been quite close to various uh, senior figures around the Johnson administration. So the, the the case for turning to some of those companies and handing over responsibility to them to collect the data and scrape the data and analyze the data and then advise the various sort of alert systems and interventions becomes all the greater. And that's where you get um, what in, in Louisa Moore's uh, Politics of Possibility, she talks, and she's talking specifically about e-borders and the, the kind of digitization of, of border control. But she talks in there about the rise of what she calls a consultocracy, where it is effectively, and I mean, you, you could say, that the fact that Cummings is, Cummings is already himself a kind of evidence of a kind of consultocracy in the sense that he's a, a consultant, not a not a not a leader as such. Um, but th this consultocracy, which Louisa Moore is writing about, is that effectively who gets across a border is, is really for IBM to decide because they're the ones who hold the contract to um, uh, to, to gauge risk in, in the kind of possibilistic way that she's talking about. And I think that ultimately 
you know, there isn't a vaccine for some years. Um, and if the economy is kind of limping on in the way that it is, and if and if, if the government isn't prepared to go for the kind of length and depth of lockdown in the future that might be necessary to actually eliminate the virus, what you have then is the market functioning as a kind of a Hayekian information system, only now also helping to highlight the fact that cases of a virus uh, are breaking out in certain places. But in partnership, with um, a, a host of, of private sector data analytics, um, uh, IT, uh, e-government outsourcing companies, who are basically delivering what it has become visibly obvious uh, the state is unable to, to deliver for itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to hand over to Jack to start running out questions, but I just kind of leave with one comment to that, which is just it seems like there's a, a really strong parallel that's a dynamic that's been going on in econ for ages, you know, of macro being micro writ large, and that you've got this notion of the subject as this individual, and it's being scaled up, and it's quite a different notion of the subject now, and perhaps, and maybe it's doing something quite different in terms of its the way in which it's monitoring, simultaneously anticipating and producing the world through 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 observing, but. Uh, it seems like you know during this crisis the real foregrounding of the local mm, yeah. uh, local government local relationships sure. uh local knowledge is something that is produced through relationships is, sure. is, is, in that sense it's the sort of um it's the unexpected return of, of, of big society kind of visions you know cameron's vision of big society in 2011 was I don't know, like the Boy Scouts and well, you know churches or whatever it might be. But this is, and of course, there's been a lot of that as well. It's been welcome uh, to see how much of that has come alive since March. But on the other hand, there is a kind of sense that you know the, the sort of the, the, this emphasis on the local, as you say, I think has kind of given a different spin on uh, many of the policy ideas that were in the mix in relation to civil society and and and, and behavioural behaviour change programmes around about 2011, 2012, which was, as I say, what my, my neo-communitarianism article um, was, was trying to capture, but uh, not for a moment <laughs> anticipating any of this. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, I can keep going, but I'm gonna hand over to Jack because I know we've got a lot of questions coming in. Thanks, Will. <laughs> There's loads of really interesting, in fact, there's a really interesting chat going on on the chat box. And rather than try, because um, a couple of people have made a few different comments and a few different questions, rather than trying to read all their questions in one, I'm wondering if I can invite Tony Curzon Price to read his own question. Would you be up for that, Tony? Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to do that. If not, I'll just read your first question. Hi. Uh, look, I, th th they were comments rather than questions, and I and and they were slightly stream of consciousness. <laughs> so, um, so I, uh, let, let me just, let me just, um, so I, I, so Will, I mean, I, I, I think I, I completely recognize a lot of what you say, but, uh, but I, I, I also sometimes think, and I, I, I think there's often about your wonderful writing on neoclassical economics, that you kind of, um, that you slightly underestimate the its capacity to um, uh, to to uh, to own the points that you're making, and in the particular case of your description of the of neo communitarianism, it seems to me that the neoclassical economists would say, yeah, well, you know, this is the bit of the discipline which was always concerned with externalities, and at the same time that you know that around that post-crisis time you say well yeah I mean you know for a long time people like Krugman or or Glazer have been interested in aspects of economic geography that make um, the sort of strict methodological individualism break down but we have ways of handling that and you know they they for example very happily turn towards Ostrom uh, in that uh, in that space to say yeah, we don't have markets here, but we have mechanisms that uh, drop into a place where we know that, again, for good Kosian reasons, markets don't exist and th that they can be Ostrom-like things or they can be the things that you're calling uh, norms and nudges. Again, it seems to me that there's, there is a kind of totalizing uh, aspect to neoclassical economics, which says, yeah, this is you're absolutely right, and this is where we put that. Um, and yes, this uh, th this continues to fit into a uh, a green book uh, a green book methodology because we've got we've got the place to put it into. We know that norms are there as the Kosian alternative to the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, really, a comment more than a question. But do you? I wonder whether. 
you know, I, I mean, you obviously, uh, you know, have an enormous uh, 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 grasp of the way in which the neoclassical mind works. But I wonder sometimes whether your um, your your opposition of it to um, various other um, uh, various other ways of seeing society is a little forced. Okay. Yeah. No. Thanks, Tony. Um, no, I appreciate the appreciate the question. Shall I take? Shall I answer the question now, or should we? Do you want to? Yeah. Go ahead. Answer now. Yeah, I'll ask. I mean, on. I think I, I hear your particular point, and I and I'm not um, the point about externalities. Absolutely, of course. And and even take someone like Gary Becker, who is normally like one of the main sort of villains in the in the mind of, of sociologists. Uh, he has his what he calls his expanded utility theory, or no, I think Ben Fine calls it an expanded utility theory in his sort of demolition of Gary Becker. But nevertheless, the 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 um uh, the the point is that Becker doesn't think that you know every rational behavior is 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 geared towards becoming richer. It's just that it's geared to some kind of future goal. But nevertheless, it is rational for for someone like Becker, um, and um, it's not. Um, you know, it, it can be presumed to be rational, even if on the face of it, it doesn't look very rational. The way to understand it is through the methodological presupposition that it is rational in it. So, so in that sense, you sort of, uh, I mean, what I argue in my, in my, um, in, in this neo-communitarianism article is that um, if you speak, I mean, of course, economists know that people aren't actually like their methods say they are, aren't actually uh, rational optimizers the entire time. I mean, that's um, get, almost goes without saying, but it is a methodological principle. If you don't assume rational optimization, whether of money or of some other uh, type of good, uh, that it becomes quite hard to um, build models in, in, in certain ways. Um, the, the, the point I'm making about the neo-communitarianism, I introduce in this article a notion that is a little bit different from the idea of, of, of externalities or in the, in the welfare economics sense of psychological externalities, which is to say that, because um, uh, a social externality in the way that Pigou talks about it um, is something that is an unfortunate side effect of, uh, or, or potentially a fortunate side effect of lots of people rationally pursuing their various interests. And of course, as Ostrom and, and Benkler and others um, identify, it is possible for people to engage in forms of committed social behavior, but nevertheless, the kind of driving force of that, unless I'm, I'm mistaken, still can be explained back to it being good for them in some kind of individual fashion. The, the problem that the nudges are, um, are, are dealing with is the fact that we fall into these habits with, of, of behavior that are actually bad for us, which are irrational because we have been somehow conditioned by circumstances into these kind of particular sort of patterns of behavior. And this is something that, I mean, um, ultimately the, the, the behavioral economic self um, is a sort of hybrid of an economic calculator and a habitual uh, conditioned social self. Um, and sometimes it behaves in a calculative fashion, sometimes it behaves in a uh, conditioned and conventional fashion. And the other thing I point out in the article is that the sort of iconic um, game from in terms of game theory from all of this is the ultimatum game, which is sort of attempt to try and sort of understand at which point people kind of become more altruistic and which point they become more calculating. Um, and the point I was making in the article anyway is that faced with all of these sorts of crises uh, of, of the social world, rather than viewing them in terms of um, failures of, of, of regulation to generate the right positive externalities or regulation which generates negative externalities, they become seen as failures of, in some sense, personal regulation or of personal behavior, which then requires di a different type of, a different sort of suite of policy interventions, which is geared towards a sort of malleable uh, subject that is capable of learning different pathways um, in ways that, to me, is not really a sort of a feature of, 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 of neoclassical economics at all. But I might be wrong about that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't claim to have, of, of, to be familiar with, with with all of the different endless different traditions of, of neoclassical economics. And it's certainly true that you know, in in my book, The Limits of Neoliberalism. Um, you know, I'm focusing on a particularly sort of aggressive Chicago school uh, view of, of, of what neoclassical economics is and, and how it works. And maybe that comes sometimes clouds my, my, my understanding of the, of, of the good guys. <laughs> Thanks, Will. That's a really interesting question. Maybe follows up a little bit on that from Callan Gravy, who asks, one of the most fascinating managerial conspiracy theories is neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, it's a method to use words to affect people's actions, but assumes that actually taking to, talking to people uh, to change what they believe isn't an option. So dialogue isn't an option. Uh, do you imagine any parallels between that and what you're trying to highlight here? 
<laughs> well, I think that the, um, uh, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, NLP is one of the kind of um, sort of, it's sort of more sort of far out kind of aspects of some of the stuff that I, I, I talk a bit about in the happiness industry. Um, but um, certainly um, there is, I suppose, a, um, a dream which is there in cybernetics. And I think it's there in particularly in neoliberal traditions of economics, both in a, of a neoclassical tradition of, of Chicago school and of, of um, uh, Austrian economics of managing to replace discourse in, in, in replace um, uh, um, the, the kind of um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even describe it now I'm so, but just, just replace replace words replace language replace the the stuff that Aristotle thought was the sort of central characteristic of human beings which is the ability to speak to one another um, or the, the sort of teleology of human beings um, and you know you read someone like uh, Milton Friedman um, he, he says you know over over values men can only fight Friedman says um, the, the, that um, you know, if you, as soon as things turn into a moral argument, there's nothing that you can really do. It's just a question of force. There's no way of, of demonstrating that one value is better than another. So it's a hugely pessimistic idea of how deliberation and the public sphere might work. Um, equally, the, if you look at the, 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 the problem, the central problems of cybernetics, right back to World War II, was how to achieve communication where forms of normal speech and, and, and textual communication are challenged. That is in conditions of aerial warfare. I mean, some of the kind of literal technical challenges of, 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 of communication that were being tackled by, if you read um, The Rise of the Machines by Thomas Ridd, which is a fabulous book about cybernetics and warfare. But you know, he talks about how actually, you know, literal problems like how to get two pilots to be able to communicate over the noise of the engine. This, this provoked the requirement for whole new different types of language and um, uh, haptics and different ways of getting an, a piece of information from one airplane to another without the, the use of, of, of normal speech. Uh, that means that communication, and this is, goes back to things like information theory and so on, becomes everything about things like whether it be body language or different forms of control panels and different forms of, um, you know, um, traffic light systems and indicators and flashing lights and various things that, 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 that through which you communicate other than through speaking. Um, and I think that this is a sort of, there's a kind of long standing, it's a kind of central dream of, of 20th century management, but I think also there in some of these traditions of economics of trying to find ways of altering someone's behavior to put it crudely, or, or at least obtaining some kind of dialogue between people so they can adapt their behavior to one another, which um, finds a, a, a route between those two agents, which is not that of, 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 of of speech and text. Uh, and that can be anything from trying to discern uh, the meaning of their body language or their facial expressions. And of course, we now, you know, you look at sort of the crazy world of neuromarketing as well, which is sort of trying to find out kind of, you know, someone's intentions as a consumer by running an advert in front of them while strapping their brain to an EEG machine, this kind of stuff. All of this stuff has been going on, but I think it's through a mixture of the, the, the problems of, of corporate management and the problems of, of, of military um, the real-time decision-making, these are the kind of central challenges that preoccupy all sorts of different fields of psychology, cybernetics, and in some respects, some bits of, of neoliberal uh, economic traditions um, at, at key moments in the 20th century. Alice, did you want to add something on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd just add in, I, you know, there's another strand here that I think that really relates back to, which is the moral hazard thing, right? All, all facets of um, asymmetric information economics. I mean, you've been talking, Will, about Friedman and the kind of radical subjectivity of utility, that utility is just basically this black box, like values are, uh, you know, that it's the center of economics, but it's also something we can't ever really know anything more about. Um, and information is the same, the whole kind of premise of information economics, which includes moral hazard, but also signaling theory, you know, fascinating, um, is talk is cheap like communication doesn't cost enough. Communication is fundamentally meaningless in and of itself. And this goes, is also kind of, you know, goes throughout rational choice theory as well, um, that you need communication in and of itself. Knowledge is kind of empty. Um, and and this is all just kind of a, a set of signals, you know, I, this, which, yeah. and I think, you know, and then there, it does, there are figures who, who ride this wave, say Akalov, then goes into the kind of norm stuff and starts drawing on sociology uh, of different ways of changing people's behavior. But, uh, but I'll pass back over to the, the questions there. Did you have something to add to that, Will, or should I just... No, no, I think it's absolutely right. And I think, I mean, you know, the, the, 
effective communication from, from, from my understanding of, of, of this field um, is that, you know, the, the, the definition of an effective communication is that it is registered by the, by the recipient agent who then responds accordingly. I mean, so it is communication and behavior change become uh, sort of coterminous in, in, in certain respects. I'd also just, can I just add in there as well, I think this, this kind of constant black boxing of central categories in economics, of utility, of information, et cetera, and the, in a similar way to the way that you've described, Will, in kind of cybernetics, um, really lends itself to economics making itself a discipline that is primarily performative. Like it's, you know, sociologists claim to describe norms and analyze them, whereas economists, you know, claim, you know, a, a reflexively almost deploying performativity in a way that obviously we talk about the performativity of economics but it seems to say something quite different about the discipline that mm. you know obviously it claims to be the science and the empirical one but actually the way in which it's producing these is almost the opposite of, sure. of which is Mirovsky's point really about the double truth is that the, is the, the, the really kind of serious, determined, but cynical members of the neoliberal thought collective knew all along that what they were doing was coming up with a new set of rules for society. They, they never kidded themselves that they were simply sort of describing what was already there. That's it. Yeah. Um, there's, I would, it'd be really nice to move on to some questions about some sure, stuff yeah, sure. at the end about authority. Um, but a last question on the same topic from Callan to kind of come back on it again. He asks, uh, doesn't this feel hugely in tension with the rhetoric of markets as a site of freedom? Um, if you don't have an interior world, how, how can you be an agent? Um, could you repeat what was the first bit, sorry? Yes, sorry, I'll just read it slower this time. Uh, doesn't this whole discussion and uh, um, feel hugely in tension with the rhetoric of markets as a site of freedom? If you don't have an interior world, how can you be an agent? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, I mean, who, I mean, the question, who, who's that question addressed to? Is it addressed to the people we're talking about or is it addressed to, to us? I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very important philosophical question. I mean, um, of course, <laughs> um, I mean, there are different, I mean, my own, my own view on that. I mean, I, I, I could sort of, we could, we could talk about, talk about the, the, the kind of substance of that question. But I think from the perspective of, of um, some of the policy traditions that, that, that I'm, describing, I mean, I think that one of the, in some ways, one of the great advantages of neoclassical economics um, and one of its sort of liberating, uh, part of its liberating potential, and also I think this was there in kind of Mises' contribution to the socialist calculation debate, is that the great advantage of an assumption of individual rationality of consumers of some sort of kind is that you don't then have to tell people what to do. You can assume that they know what they're doing. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't underestimate how important that that, that um, basically liberal principle is that it avoids a kind of paternalistic attempt to try and tell people what's good for them. I mean, that is the sort of starting point of, 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 of neoliberalism in its contribution to the socialist calculation debate from 1920 onwards is to say, you know, like there is no way of people have internal worlds, but you can't know what they are. You know, you have to just assume that they, that they have a certain kind of, um, formal rationality to them, but people's desires and people's values and people's tastes are completely their own business. And there is no way of, 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 of coming up with any objective standard of them. Now that is something that has been challenged by all sorts of economists in, and various other people in various ways, but I think it has a certain sort of, it's important I think to at least recognize on its own terms that it has uh, an attempt to defend something about individual liberty and privacy that of course can be taken way too far. I think in the, in a cybernetic tradition, it's more a level of agnosticism, an attempt to try and get away from the sort of crypto ontologies of, of the social sciences um, and the, the natural sciences for that matter, to say, let's just sort of scrap all we think we know about society and nature or even the difference between the two and simply imagine what happens if people are, uh, and machines and objects and so on are imagined as 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 interacting black boxes in space that are trying to communicate with each other and and are forming various patterns in various ways um, and i think there's a certain sort of you know the 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 impetus for that is really much more of a is the, is the impetus of control which is to say well it might be better if we're trying to actually control the situation rather than we don't actually need to know that much about it we might be better off simply running various tests and trying to predict various paths of, of behavior and so on and if our if our goal here is, is to control the situation control the virus control the um whatever the you know the aerial aerial bombardment or whatever it might be uh, it might be better to simply focus 
on the interactions and the failed interactions and the patterns that result than on to try and make some sort of to impute some sort of theory of of, of, of the self or the mind or the subject and that's really a sort of a, a, a strategic um and a purely practical uh decision in, in, in first and foremost but of course it you know it it, it um, runs up against all sorts of problems in various ways i mean it kind of links us a little bit to to, to, to sort of you know, contemporary traditions of things like actor network theory as well, which have also operated with, with similarly sort of what some of call kind of flat ontologies, where you sort of start with the assumption of, of, of not really knowing anything about what the different things are other than, than how they relate to each other. That's a really nice place to move the conversation onto one of the things we were discussing at the end, which is about authority and the kind of shifts in modes of control. Um, so if, if authority, if the current present government has a different conception of authority that shifts away from legal rules towards tweaking the networks uh, through the wet network of actions through different nudges, then what's the concept of politics or political legitimacy involved here? Or is this just a nuisance? Is the politics just a nuisance that you have to win in order to gain control and retain control in the kind of control room of the network? Or is there some way in which politics is supposed to interact with this, especially given that Brexit was about sovereignty and about kind of reassertion of politics? How do these two things square? I mean, do they? Well, I mean, I think um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think so. This this new statesman article, which 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 I've written, which is out tomorrow. I mean, in that, I argue that actually, in some ways, if you wanted to run a kind of behavioural state um, or a kind of a state of a, a nudging state, in some ways, it makes the need for some at least idea of a social contract in a liberal sense even more important because in a way you know it, it becomes actually more more important that that those in the higher reaches of power look like they are also bound by rules in in the way that is kind of crucial to a, to a liberal idea of a, of a, of a contract um, because you know because it then undergirds the sense that there is still some outer uh, kind of um, limit of, of normativity within which these various sort of normative experiments are being conducted. If it looks too like those in the top are are, are lawless and uh, and sort of have no respect for norms, which is in some ways the kind of unfortunately the defining uh, virtue of this government. We should say it's a virtue because you know the reason Boris Johnson's got an eighty something seat majority is because you know he drove the JCB through the bricks saying get Brexit done and you know and he was prepared to rip up all kinds of promises about the relationship between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom and you know and he he doesn't give a shit I mean that's the sort of that is why that is why he 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 got the votes that he did in some of the crucial parts of the country that he did so you know it's a there's a sort of very dangerous combination between a, a, a type of executive authority that is really kind of at certain points has been kind of nakedly lawless. And of course, you know, there was the, the famous confrontation with the Supreme Court last September. Um, there's been all sorts of kind of moments where, um, uh, you know, Johnson has, has, has tried to extract political capital by sort of breaking rules in various ways. Um, but this means that if you ally that vision of executive power to this kind of um, what is potentially can look like a rather cynical vision of norms as reduced to types of uh, experimental intervention, then you have a real sense of, 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 well, kind of who is, you know, what is the kind of bottom line here? Who is, what, what is the sort of basis of, 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 of civil society in a, in, a, in a quite profound sense? Um, and I think this is the this is the, the worry at the moment. I mean, I'm, I don't want to sort of exaggerate about what I think is the sort of, you know, what what is the kind of political agenda? I mean, the political agenda of Johnson is to is to remain prime minister, and I think he'd do that under whatever in whatever way he needs to do under whatever circumstances are presented to him, which at the moment is you know is to, is to be doing what he's doing. Um, but I think that it is the um, this 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 does pose these questions about a type of Schmittian state of exception in certain respects, where effectively, you know, for Schmidt, the legal order starts from, not from, um, you know, the legal order can't be self-grounding. The legal order requires something which is extra legal and is neither inside the law nor outside the law, but simply it starts with a, with a, with a moment of decision uh, that, that a legal order will be one way, not the other. Um, and I think that, okay, you could say that's, um, that, 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 that would be the case even if, if Johnson was not in power, but I think that there's something has be, there's something become rather more kind of naked about um, the sense that the, the, the executive branch of government is hostile to um, maybe not rule of law as such. I'm not suggesting that Johnson is a kind of you know a kind of Orbanite or a or a sort of Putinite kind of um, sort of post liberal in, in, in that way. But I think that there is a sort of sense that. Um, 
particularly enabled by Brexit, that the grounds of ultimate authority uh, lie outside of the, the legal system in some ways. And it's the, it's the combination of that with the kind of nudge infrastructure and, and the sort of cybernetic vision that, that, that comes from somewhere else altogether that I think is particularly troubling at the moment. And I think really makes the sense of there being any kind of um, functioning contract at a, at, at a mass scale uh, very hard to sustain. Okay, we're gonna take one last question before we finish. Uh, we'll finish probably five minutes after. Um, last question is from Simon Arthur who asks, how does nudge theory prevent overspill without authority? If we nudge too many people to the pub, then it can result in a spike of COVID. If people are then all leave that pub and go to another pub, then the spike will follow. So how can nudge theory exist routinely, uh, sorry, entirely without norms and authority? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think that the, um, I mean, the answer is always with enough data and enough data an analysis. I mean, that's always the answer is, is these, you need data and you need to, you need to then um, uh, be able to understand um, the, the pattern formation and, and, and deploy things like complexity theory in order to try and understand, you know, these sorts of behavioral movements at some sort of scale. Um, but I think, I mean, my, you know, the, the, the point I'm making is that there, there are still norms in place, but they are norms which, um, it is expected that the norms will only, will be, I mean, of course, all, no, no norm is, 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 is unbreakable and no norm is unbroken. So it's naive to think that any government ever kind of creates rules or, or laws um, with the expectation that they are followed perfectly. But I think that there is a different sort of rationality in, in play uh, once rules and norms become ways of trying to kind of steer people and control people, which is which is what's happening. And I don't think that's not the government's fault. In some ways, is the the, the 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 circumstances that have been brought about by the nature of the pandemic. Um, but I think that um, yes, I mean, of course, there are potential to do it in a cack handed way is which is far more likely than to do it in an effective way. Is you know can produce all sorts of Kind of uh, of these sorts of um, uh, sort of vicious circles and, and and side effects and so on of the sort that you're describing, um, and I think that uh, the question of where accountability and responsibility is going to lie in all of this is is really unclear. I mean, already the government is you know only today Johnson has there's been another kind of sort of argument over the fact that Johnson has, has been trying to kind of palm off responsibility for the care home mortality rate onto care homes not, not doing their jobs properly and they've, they've been blaming um, you know Public Health England for getting things wrong and they've been blaming various scientists for getting things wrong and they're trying to sort of push responsibility all over the place um, but at the same time just to come back to something Alice mentioned earlier about the you know I mean, I had this line in this LRB article, London Review of Books article from, from early on in all of this, where I said, we're all Dirk Hymians now. And it was sort of a bit tongue in cheek. But what I meant was that, you know, we, the, the, the headlines are dominated by these aggregates, these, these, these curves that I'm sure we've all seen from the Financial Times and elsewhere of, of comparative mortality rates, which are measured at a national level. There is still, in some ways, the nation state remains the kind of key unit uh, for the imagination of politics. And I think that there remains a sort of a, a problem here where, you know, our media, our uh, imaginings of, of, of political authority uh, are still kind of in some ways kind of map onto the nation state as its kind of default sort of unit of, of state space, uh, if you like. Um, meanwhile, what the government is trying to do is to effectively kind of create um, something which is uh, far more sort of outsourced um, decentralized and adaptive, I think, um, which I think it will take a huge amount of um, technical wherewithal, the like of which can only possibly come from the private sector to get even close to it. But I think that if you look at the rhetoric and you look at the, the, the symbolism and you look at the sort of um, lack of interest in other types of policy intervention, it can only be that the government is, is, is putting its faith in that sort of direction. And when you look at the makeup of, of SAGE as well, and you know, people want to know why a, is, is, is the data analyst uh, expert from Vote Leave on that, on, that, on that committee. I mean, that this is being seen as a way of trying to kind of map and control behavior at scale in, in a decentralized fashion. Um, and I don't say that in a, in a sort of, I don't mean to sound sort of paranoid in saying that, I just think that um, the, the, the sort of policies that are at the government's disposal and the ones that they, uh, that they have shown an interest in using so far point in that broad ideological direction, not to say, which isn't to say that it will be successful. And um, I think it's failures 
will be both to our benefit, but also greatly to our cost. Because to our benefit, I think it would be that, you know, the ability to run a, a sort of perfectly controlled society simply isn't going to arise, um, uh, particularly with a, with a government with this little competence at its disposal. Um, but the failure, of course, will be found also in the, in, in, in the health, health consequences. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was a really interesting and oh, slightly depressing point to end. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us, everyone for questions, thank you to Will, thank you for Alice, um, and also this is our last session of the, I guess, sort of term, <laughs> the whatever is left of the term, um, we're going to return in September or October time with another series, probably also uh, in digital form, uh, and maybe one day back uh, in flesh again, uh, so thank you everybody for joining, and thank you again to Will and Alice and everyone else for asking.